Hey guys, Victoria Jones Griffith here, and we are back with part three of my five V's and living a victorious life. So we are on the lesson number three, which is the voice. And if you guys have not picked up my book yet, it is on Amazon, both paperback and ebook, and also on iTunes with ebook. And most of you guys know you've got the app on your phone if you have an iPhone that you can download the iBooks in. It looks a little different. I prefer how it looks on Amazon, but it's pretty cool to have it accessible on iTunes as well. So I've been starting each video with reviewing the five V's. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that before we jump into our number three, which is the voice. So real quick, our five V's, the center is the victorious life that we're heading towards. So lesson number one, or the first V, is victimhood. And those of you that have experienced some sort of trauma, sexual abuse, physical abuse, We've all gone through that victim stage and that's where we start out. But the key is to let go of that victim story and change that story. And I talked about in my first video, if you haven't watched it, in order to change that story, we have to retrain our brain, create positive neural pathways. And I talked about that in the video. We have to go from a negative thought process to a positive and practice, practice, practice. So I give those tips on how to do that in the first video. Then the second V, which was last last video, is the validation. And that is basically our, our need for external approval, validation, in order to get out of that victim mentality, we have to look at ourselves, go within, and give ourselves so much love, self-love. I talk about the self-love rituals that I did in order to create those positive neural pathways and positive thoughts with sticky notes, mirror work, self-talk, affirmations, journaling, and then my metabolic typing program in order to start really feeling good inside and out with the right kind of foods and there is no one size fits all to this healing process. So we have to bring it all in. So now we're gonna be talking about the voice today. So I'll come back to that. But the fourth V is vulnerability, which I can't wait to talk about that because that is balancing our masculine and feminine sides and finding the right balance of vulnerability because we can use vulnerability for as a strength. And uh, then the fifth V is the victory, and that is living the victorious life. But in that one, I talk about living in the flow and lots of scientific research on that lately. Can't wait to bring that to you. So let's go back to number three, the voice, and why I think it is so important that victims use to get out of that victimhood state we can't keep everything in. Now, I went big and wrote a book about it. You do not have to go big and write a book, but you do have to let it go. That means let it out. Whether you go and talk to somebody, a therapist, or like I talk about in the book, a spiritual director, you've got to let that trauma and the events go because it will stay in your cell tissue. It will cause dis-ease, as I talk about in the book. It will cause a lot of different issues because you're 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 holding on to that shame and that guilt and that is so toxic so you have to get it out journaling like i talked about in the second lesson is is a great way to do that and that is using your voice whether it's out loud or just vocalizing and finally talking it through with somebody with one other person that is sharing your story so you can rewrite your story. A lot of us that are victims and in, in stuck in that cycle of abuse are pleasers. And we have gotten so used to being quiet and pleasing others that we've lost our voice. So we have to find our voice 
and that requires us going within. So when we find our voice, we find our true authentic self as well, which a lot of us have pushed away, have pushed down and are not, we've lost touch with who we really are because we've become so focused on maybe, you know, even the abusive situation that we're in or going from one abusive situation to the other. And we've let, let those situations chip away at us and we have convinced ourselves we're damaged goods and all that, what I've talked about in the first V in victimhood is that inner critic that keeps us down and keeps us from moving forward. We have to drop those labels. We have to drop the victim label, which is so important. Along with uh, vocalizing our, our truth, we also have to start talking about sexual assault in making it not so taboo. 63% of sexual assault victims don't report. There's a reason for that because there's so much blaming the victim and what goes on into to the mind, into the, into the, what goes on in the head of an assault victim in, in processing it because we don't have enough education behind what's actually going on in the brain. So in chapter 13, I talk about the fight, flee, or freeze response. And in my situation, in all my sexual assaults, I froze. And now, you know, in the, during my healing process, in my work with my spiritual director, I learned why I actually did freeze and what was actually happening in the brain. And that allowed me to finally begin to speak out and not be ashamed of it because we know what's going on. And again, it's not a one size fits all response. Everybody responds differently. So with me freezing, I would shame myself because I, I couldn't understand why would I just allow these things to happen. And what I, what I came to, to understand and realize is that that part of the brain, that decision-making center, that prefrontal cortex goes offline typically in a, an assault. And if you're being assaulted or abused by someone that you know, that you think should be loving you and that you actually have in your, in your brain have convinced yourself that you love, that also causes so much confusion within the brain. And, and it's hard for your brain to catch up. Um, I mean, I talked about earlier in my first feat about how hard it is to rewire to positive thoughts. Can you imagine if it's an assault situation? So your sympathetic nervous system goes into overdrive. And so all of that, that rational thinking becomes irrational and you can't, you know, that's why a lot of people don't even remember what happened because your brain is not is not working um, properly and you're not clear headed and in that also a lot of victims can't remember because they have put it they've buried the event in their subconscious mind it's still in there and that's what's so toxic because that that gets into your cell tissue your nerves and then again that's where a lot of disease and illness and pain manifests because of that trauma and we have to release it. We have to find it and then release it. So the other thing, other part of the third V, the voice is I talk about forgiveness and that is crucial to healing, letting the anger go and forgiving, first of all, yourself, because what I had to do is I had to forgive myself for putting myself in those situations a lot of the times after my first assault in, in telling myself it, those, the wounds that were inflicted on me were not my fault, but my healing was my responsibility. I was forgiving myself and in turn forgiving the men that assaulted me and abused me in order to set myself free and to heal and that allowed me to experience a lot more joy in my life because I wasn't so bogged down with those negative emotions. Fear and shame will just is, is just so toxic. And I also started rewiring my thought process on thinking that these men actually allowed me to look 
inward and learn so much more about myself. So it was such, there's so much wisdom. So I, I don't look back and say, okay, these were all these mistakes that I made. I look at it as learning, learning experiences and the wisdom that I gained that, I, that I'm now sharing. So do I think everybody needs to go down the dark path and repeat these patterns over and over again? No, that's why I wrote my book. Because I think if you, you catch it early, have awareness of it and change that story and that you're not damaged goods and that, that you don't have to remain in this, this holding pattern, in this stuck pattern and not go to becoming the best version of yourself. That's why I wrote my book so that you, you can, can do it at a faster pace than I did because it's possible. So the practice that I have, and each of my five V's I have a practice, whether it be physical or or kind of an internal practice, this kind of hits both because it's meditation. It is a heart meditation. And I chose a heart meditation because dealing with forgiveness, we've got to go within and open up our hearts and forgive if you are a victim of, of abuse, sexual abuse or assault. Um, but also, uh, there's a lot of confusion about meditation and mindfulness. It's all out there right now. But in my healing process, I worked with a spiritual director who helped me learn how to meditate. She called it going to level. Because I think back then, if she said heart meditation or meditation in general, I would have just like been like, oh, rolled my eyes. That's too ooey gooey, woo 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 woo. Um, that wouldn't work. I'm not a yogi. I have to do yoga to meditate. So she kind of tricked me in a good way. I love her dearly for that and taught me how to meditate, which allowed me to heal. And I became, I, I, I became healthier on the outside and the inside through meditation. So the difference between meditation and mindfulness, mindfulness is maybe what you're doing right now, being present in the now. And that is different than meditation. Meditation is truly calming the mind, slowing down. You can still have distractions, but it is, it is, is more directed inward and really changing. You can really change that brain chemistry. With mindfulness, that's not where the, the changes in the brain occur. So 95% of disease comes from stress. We know that. So meditation allows us to reduce our stress, reduce our cortisol levels, get out of that sympathetic nervous system and go into more parasympathetic where healing happens. So if you've been told you have high cortisol levels, high stress levels, this is a free way to lower those stress levels. It also helps you rewire your brain, that neuroplasticity I was talking about, and release those good uh, neurochemicals that are essential for healing as well as happiness. And those are your dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, epinephrine, we'll just hit that whole family, oxytocin, that is, is crucial for keeping that brain healthy and happy. So you'll be hearing a lot more of that in certain studies that are out now. Also, you can change your DNA for more anti-aging, more longevity. So the telomeres which are at the end of your chromosome, you can actually lengthen your telomeres by meditation. So that all has to do with lowering that inflammation. That's where everything's going. Even our diet and our workouts all are geared towards that. So obviously our mindset work and meditation works right in with it. So without further ado, I wanna take you through a, this is going to be guided, even though you will be doing this on your own. I just have to show you it first. It is 16 seconds total. If you do this four times, you've meditated for a minute. Yay! And doing it throughout the day can really make some huge changes in your health. So, since it's a heart meditation, I want you to bring your hands to heart center. 
And I do recommend like maybe bringing your thumbs or part of your hand touching your heart center because when we talk about mindfulness, wherever you bring your physical body, that's where your awareness will go. So I want your awareness to go to your heart. You can think of forgive, forgiving thoughts and gratitude. So that's kind of woo woo. If you're not there and it's okay, by the way, distractions are okay while you're meditating. It, we're not monks, so we're gonna have distractions. You can't quiet your mind fully. That would be impossible. It's like uh, completely stopping your heart. We don't want that, right? So the distractions coming through are fine. You will slow them down. And over time, you'll even get better at that. But completely clearing them out, impossible. So we're going to bring our hands to, to heart center and then we're gonna focus on our breath. Four seconds, inhale, hold, for four seconds and then we're going to release it and hold for four seconds or just let a long breath go i prefer in through the nose out through the mouth i have a deviated septum so even breathing in through the nose is even tricky <laughs> so wherever you can get the deepest breath that's going to be very calming that's why you want to get a good inhalation so let's try it so you're going to breathe in for four Hold for four. Release for four. And then hold for four at the bottom. And then I want you to do it again. And you can do this anywhere. You don't even have to close your eyes if you don't want to. Kind of helps clear some of those distractions out, especially if you're a busy mom or you're at work. You can do this anywhere. You don't have to be laying down. You do not have to be a yogi. I stress, you don't have to be a yogi. In fact, it's very hard for me to find a yoga class that I want to go to because it's all about working out. And I got that part down almost too much. The inner work is the hardest for all of us. So that is important that you separate yoga from meditation. If you go to yoga and they have great meditation, then that's great. Also, your workouts, sorry, they're not your meditation. I used to say that too. That's an excuse. You're moving, you're moving, you're distracting. That's not focusing on within. I'm proud of you, you're focusing on your health, yay. But you've got to go within in order to meditate and truly find your voice, because that's what we were talking about in this video, and discover your true, authentic self. She's in there. So until next time, be victorious. I'll see you next time.